So the final two of these principles we want to go through, which obviously we're taking account for in, in the weightlifting AI app, is SRA curve, which we can, we'll explain a little bit more about that um, later in this video, but then also phase potentiation, mm. how one phase sort of leads into the next, builds qualities relevant for the next, and I guess almost optimize, optimizes the next sort of phase yeah. of a program. Potentiates. How it potentiates the phase, <laughs> it's in the name. Do you want to talk a little bit about what or why that is and then how we how we sort of account for that in, a, yeah, in the so, programming? So really phase potentiation is just the strategic organization of phases that potentiate the next phase, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we're defining the word with the word. <laughs> but really what we want to have is the thing you just got done training yeah. and the way you just trained should augment the next phase you do in a way that would be better than if you didn't do this phase, yeah, yeah. right? Because we want our training to always be the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. So the simplest analogy here is that you're, you're basically going to start, when we see this in every training cycle, everyone knows this is high volume, low intensity, and then those two, those two things, you know, basically move in opposite directions. Yeah. And you go from high volume, low intensity to higher intensity, lower volume to max out Friday every week, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so really what we want to see here is that the things we're doing in the initial phase are conducive to helping us maximize the next phase because each phase becomes subsequently more specific to the yeah. sport of weightlifting. Yeah. So the first phase, hypertrophy, work capacity, general fitness, mm -hmm. we're moving from minimum effective volumes Right. Starting at the base and building towards maximum recoverable volumes. Yeah. We're increasing the overload mechanisms, which mm -hmm. are, you know, density of training, so mm -hmm. shorter rest times, mm -hmm. uh, uh, work capacity, mm -hmm. which can be developed with either more sets, more reps, mm -hmm. bigger total volumes, uh, and then hypertrophy, so increases in total volume, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe increases in, in reps per set. Right. So any of those mechanisms is moving in the upward direction, mm -hmm. right? At the end of that initial phase of hypertrophy and general fitness, we should be able to tolerate a huge amount of training, yeah. lots of reps, be, be able to handle that really well with mm -hmm. minimum minimal technical breakdown yeah. because we have lots of fitness. So we can take that mm -hmm. and move from maximum recoverable volumes, right. the highest volumes we can tolerate for strength level work, so mm -hmm. high intensities, moderate mm -hmm. to high intensities, yeah. and relatively high volumes, yeah. and start tapering the volume down so doing mm. less and less work because we don't want the qualities that are developed from high volume training mm -hmm. which is work capacity etc yeah and increase the overload overload mechanism of intensity, intensity yeah. adding weight to the bar so those mm -hmm. two things move in opposite directions which gives us the, the magical effect of right. getting stronger and reducing volume so we can actually continue to add weight to the bar how big is the base of a pyramid right <laughs> yeah, there you go there yeah. you go and then Finally, we move into peaking, yeah. right? And we're at the maximum level of strength. We have huge amounts of strength. Yeah. We, we're great at producing force, very powerful now. We need to turn that into technical skill, mm -hmm. right? Absolute perfection in the lifts right. with maximum and near maximum weights. Mm -hmm. And so we have the relatively good work capacity for doing you know, large volumes of strength work and heavy mm -hmm. training, but we don't have the refinement of perfection, perfecting the skill with m single repetitions, maximum yeah. lifts. And so we practice that throughout peaking by starting with you know a certain number of like 90 percent and above mm -hmm. lifts mm -hmm. and increasing that number and increasing the intensity of the bar so right. as we approach the peak and the taper we've practiced as much as we possibly can mm -hmm. doing the most lifts with 90 percent and above mm -hmm. and adding weight to the bar as often as possible to touch heavy lifts and practice the sport of competing and lifting right. maximum weights yeah i think often when people tend to conceptualize peaking for a competition over a 12, 16 week period, you're sort of picturing that you're gonna be at your strongest right at the day of competition, mm. but you're really not because that's yeah. that's another quality that you're gonna strip off yep. in exchange of being able to continue snatching and clean, yeah. jerking better and better. Um, to it, the point where when you go to competition, like you, your one RM squat's not gonna be there necessarily, but your ability to create Peak velocity with seventy percent of a max right. deadlift, basically, is what it is, is like at its absolute yeah. peak. Yeah, it's yeah. and really training is just like you can look at it as it's a cascading effect of of trade offs of 
decaying one fitness quality mm-hmm. in exchange for the next fitness quality. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. the stronger you get and the more advanced you get, the less significant those things are. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't look that way because like Lasha's doing really heavy squats, but they're not necessarily heavy. Lasha's squatting 340 kilos mm-hmm. or whatever he's doing, you know, 320 in the training hall yeah. is a relatively light weight for him. I mean, yeah. He's snatching he 100 fast. kilos less than that. Yeah. yeah. So you know, he's doing maintenance volumes. Two or three reps, yeah. you know, two doubles at 300 kilos yeah. is a maintenance workout yeah, for Lasha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's only touching the minimum amount of training he needs to to preserve those fitness qualities to support what he needs in competition. Yeah. And, you know, sort of a side piece, but we know that maintenance volumes decrease. Mm-hmm. So the minimum num- amount of work you need to do decreases as the intensity increases. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. why you see programs and training in the training hall, which is very heavy, very low volume. Right. Right. Watching the Chinese team do very heavy deadlifts and pulls yeah, yeah. prior to the competition because they are trying to preserve the fitness quality of of you know force production and you know mm-hmm. uh, static strength in their low backs prior to the competition. They're not building new strength. They're not doing you know five by five right, <laughs> snatch yeah, yeah. deadlifts. They're doing some very heavy pulls, but it's a few singles, right? And Maybe we, some doubles. Are we defining fitness basically as your ability to do the sport? Fitness is always defined by the quality. So right. fitness in the sense you know fitness in the sense of uh, it's like a general quality. So yeah. like fitness would be like you know hypertrophy is a fitness quality. Okay. Right, uh, no, strength is a fitness quality. And right? So, how much of these various fitness qualities are we willing to lose in exchange for competition day? Well, and does it depend on how big the competition is? Like, how much do we want to strip various things to keep promoting the snatch and the clean and jerk before we think, you know what? In the long run, this might not be worth it because we're going to have to build these other things back up again. Well, we're never actually getting to a point where we're eliminating the training of them. There's mm-hmm. always some degree of maintenance mm-hmm. work being done there. It's just a matter of you know, how much that is. Yeah. Uh, and that's something that, that ultimately is... The goal is to never get to a point where we're going two steps forward, one step back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? We're basically going two steps forward and... Hold. Yeah, holding and <laughs> then kind of going forward, right? So you don't ever have a situation where like we're, we're going to lose strength in our squats mm. in exchange for this. We're going to lose time to train the squat at MEV levels yeah. in exchange for competing in a weightlifting meet, mm-hmm. right? So we lose time, not necessarily quality. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. So should we move into SRA? Right. Uh, the SRA curve, first off, might be worth you explaining what that even stands for. It's an an acronym. Rather yeah. Than, I would say an, an acronym, but it's definitely an acronym. Yeah. Um, yeah. Explain what that is. Yeah. So SRA curve is just stimulus recovery adaptation. So the impetus of a stimulus happening, the decrease in fitness quality, well, actually the increase in fatigue. Yeah down to the, the uh, baseline, to, the, to whatever the lowest level mm-hmm. is. The time frame between that lowest point and the actual point of return, which would be the recovery, right. and then the point above baseline, which would be the adaptation. Mm-hmm. So let's say, you know, a simple example is you squat 100 kilos for five on Monday, you're super sore and tired for Tuesday, yeah. and then on Wednesday, you completely recover, yeah. or maybe Wednesday you get more recovered, then Thursday you're totally recovered, now you can do 105 for five. Right, yeah. Those right? are the good old days. The good old days yeah. when progress just happened, yeah. right? The, the, what we want to do with SRA, SRA curve is a flexible thing. Right. It's different for different exercises mm-hmm. and for different intensity mm-hmm. zones. Think of SRA, the SRA curve, uh, or a, a stimulus as a multifaceted thing. Mm-hmm. It's not just exercise, right? Deadlift has a very high SRA right. curve if you use a lot of weight. Snatch has right? very low. Snatch has yeah. very low, right? Even if 100% snatch and 100% deadlift, mm-hmm. the same relative intensity, but significantly different SRA curves. That's why nobody does a deadlift every day program. Right. Like, just one. <laughs> like, a squat is hard enough. The yeah. popular deadlift every day program <laughs> yeah. only lasted a few days, yeah. right? Um, yeah, and so really what we do, we use SRA the SRA principle to essentially uh, influence how the, the weekly structure is constructed. And the general sense, and how this is done mm-hmm. in the weightlifting AI, mm-hmm. is that we use that to influence what we call consolidation of stressors. Mm-hmm. So different training intensity zones, 
right? Different yeah. qualities we're training have different SRA curves. Yeah, yeah. Hypertrophy and work capacity have very short SRA curves, mm-hmm. meaning that those stressors mm-hmm. can be distributed across the week much more evenly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So you'll actually look at like the analytics page and you can see the little intensity yeah, chart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's going to look like rolling hills in the first block, mm-hmm. very low, small changes in mm-hmm. intensity, but very consistent volume. Right. As the strength block approaches, the, the wave gets bigger. Mm-hmm. So we would take the the exercises and do what we call consolidation of stressors. Yeah, yeah. Move hard things to the same days yeah. so that we're able to do large training sessions with a lot of window of recovery mm-hmm. so that we can, we can benefit from it. Yeah. Right? And then as we get to peaking, those things get even more significant and that mm-hmm. window becomes like this larger, sorry, yeah. the graph becomes much more vast, right? Big right, up right, and down. Right. And so, really, what we look oh, at—that's interesting. I never thought, oh, I never thought about it like that. Yeah. Like at the, at, the, at the start, the the GPP style, hypertrophy style stuff is, you can basically spread volume and intensity almost equally mm-hmm. for each day, and then when you start looking, particularly when you're looking at a master sport program in their peaking phase, you have these incredibly high intensity days, particularly in the snatch and clean and jerk, and they'll have you know high intensity front squats, and then days that are sixty percent snatches. Yeah. And that's when we're seeing yep. this a whole lot. Exactly. We're just becoming more organized with it. And really what we're trying to do, you know, in each phase we have a motor quality we're training. We have yeah, something yeah. with, we have directed adaptation as a goal. Yeah. Something we're trying to train. That influences everything else. Right. right? Specificity. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the SRA curve, it basically allows us to say, what can we put along that curve? What exercises and training sessions can we dot along that curve mm. as you go from stimulus to, to adaptation? that are not going to negatively impact the, the SRA curve. So if we were right. to say, you do Monday, you know, SRA, your first stimulus is mm-hmm. five by five squat at 110%, mm-hmm. right? And you're just destroyed. And then the next day you come in and you're like, well, I'm gonna prove, you know, I'm gonna prove Glenn <laughs> yeah, yeah. and Max and everybody else wrong, five by five at 112%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you, it's like it's just going to keep pushing you down yeah, further until yeah, the yeah. fabric rips and, and you die. Yeah. But the SRA, or sorry, the, the SRA curve is something we're trying to dot as much productive training as we can along that mm-hmm. without being super disruptive mm-hmm. for the sport of weightlifting because we really want to influence and maximize technical practice and skill development. We yeah. always want to be maximizing that because it's such a technical sport. Mm-hmm. Um, so what you see in... in early training phases like hypertrophy is Mm -hmm. this rolling hills because you can basically string along yeah you know let's say every single session can be pretty similar yeah yeah, yeah. right the sessions in between the hard ones can be relatively difficult too because Mm -hmm. everything is not so hard right Mm -hmm. the recovery is very fast as you move into the strength blocks the exercises we have to dot along that sra curve Mm -hmm. have to be more selective we want exercises that are high relative difficulty but low absolute intensity so yeah. a great example would be like if you're snatching on Monday really heavy and doing a big yeah. workout, your Tuesday snatch session yeah. should be something that is both relatively difficult yeah. but absolutely less weight. Like a no foot, no. Exactly. Yeah, no, right? whatever. No something, book. yeah, it's challenging, it's, it's difficult, mm-hmm. but it's difficult because it's restrictive. Yeah. So it gives you the same ability to practice challenging exercises with un, under a, a load that are developing skill but not so hard that it's actually developing more fatigue and right. furthering that curve yeah. right and then as we get to, to peaking we're doing the same thing we have to even be more selective because the sra curve is going to get a little longer right right so it's almost like with sra because we've got like you said it's almost it's like this 3d thing where each individual exercise has its own shape of curve mm-hmm. each set and intensity will based on the dose of each set uh and then almost like a day's training can be seen as a as a stress of its own a week could be seen as a stress that would have a longer recovery phase Mm -hmm. it's almost like the correct grouping and organization of this is what is so important exactly and the way thing ai actually the 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 architecture with how it builds microcycles based on phases Mm -hmm. Is essentially changing, right? Yeah. So we have like you could imagine a list of the exercise of the the workouts, yeah. meaning the sessions. So snatch, mm-hmm. clean, jerk, yeah. uh, squats. Those each individual one could be ordered from most strenuous, most fatiguing, to least fatiguing. Right. And then we would pick them and mm-hmm. place them along the week mm. 
depending on the phase, by how they're going to stack up together. Yeah, yeah. And we basically have what we would call, a template's the wrong word, but we'd have like a roadmap, yeah. right, as to how the sessions are constructed based on how the magnitude of that session as a combined unit is going to affect the rest of the week. What's mm-hmm. the, what is the approximate SRA trajectory, really, right. of that session? So if we were to take the list and put all the number ones on that list, all the heaviest cleans, yeah, yeah. snatches, jerks, and squats on one day, mm-hmm. that'd be a monster day, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't make sense. In right. hypertrophy, we might have all of those number ones spread out across the week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah, yeah. the number twos after them, the number threes, right? Yeah. And so that changes. You'll see a lot of times the Wafting AI, it'll give somebody a hypertrophy phase mm-hmm. or early in the training cycle, a phase that is much more distributed having fewer, mm-hmm. like like a snatch session on one day and a clean jerk session the other day mm-hmm. because it's distributing the stressors. Mm-hmm. As they move to strength and peaking, it'll consolidate those and have snatch and clean jerk the same days. Yeah, that makes sense. So a question which I think intuitively maybe it's obviously a stupid thing to do, but to be able to explain it, it's proving hard in my mind thinking about it, is why is it when we create a stress and then we recover and then you can call it adaptation or super compensation, whatever you will, when it's when you get a little bit better, why can you not just keep stressing? You stress, you do your five by five at 110, next day it's 112, the day after that it's down at 105, after that it's down at 95. And you're getting worse and worse, but you're continuing to stress. Why can't you just do that and then be like, all right, I've put in all of this. Now I'm just going to chill and recover for two weeks. And I'm going to go in and hit a 115 5 by 5 Because you actually haven't had a full SRA curve. You've had SR, S, stimulus, <laughs> recover, <laughs> stimulus. Re- there was the adaptation happening. Right, right? okay. There's n- you, you, what you'd essentially be doing is actually... My, my, You're interrupting the A with more. Yeah, really what you'd be doing is training for a different adaptation than you think you are, mm-hmm. right? Um, especially in power sports, mm-hmm. grinding and doing really excessive volumes in power sports is not conducive to speed quality. Yes, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you just continually add harder and harder training, more and more, and you keep increasing fatigue, mm-hmm. right? You're going to end up in a point where... Uh, the adaptations your body is making are not necessarily those that are beneficial for speed and power, mm-hmm. right? They might be beneficial for endurance, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or they might, you know, it, depending on exactly how you're doing it, uh-huh. but you're, you might be shifting to a different type of adaptation. Right? So for a power sport, there are all these different qualities. You have been, you have known to have been involved in another similar project for a different sport yeah. once, powerlifting. Um, where there are almost fewer things to maybe be concerned about. Like, you know, you don't necessarily have to worry so much about how quickly you can move on any given day. It's much more just force-based. How much more difficult was it in creating or being able to sort of group stresses in in weightlifting AI? Does so, that make sense? Yeah, so the... Pa- Powerlifting or weightlifting is yeah. they're very similar in the sense that the principles are always the same. Yeah. It's just a magnitude of those things. Right. So in powerlifting, we know that technical qualities don't decay or, or don't decay or degrade very quickly. Yeah. Right. Your squat technique is probably not going to fall apart mm-hmm. even if you squat really hard. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, weightlifting, we're walking that balance of ensuring that we're one giving the most technical skill practice we can, mm-hmm. and maximizing training load right and that's a fine balance of we we really have to play into auto regulation with this we have to make sure that we're at at the threshold of being able to do really good training without overdoing mm-hmm. and so with powerlifting it's a little more simple because you can have really large you know six by six seven by eight giant squat workouts or deadlift workouts mm-hmm. or bench workouts because there's no speed component you have to worry about right. you also don't need to have high frequency technical practice mm-hmm. i mean like you would in weightlifting, five mm-hmm. sessions of snatch a week, you might have two or three sessions of squatting in a week, mm-hmm. right? It's 50% less. Right, right. So are we unable to overload quite as much in any specific dose in order to conserve the ability to perform high sort of skill activities? Yeah, it's essentially that we're not, we're not, that we're not able to, it's that the optimal method, the optimal yeah. approach would be to maximize those things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So just very quickly then, how are we... We, 
how are you? <laughs> <laughs> when we came up with this and we coded up, no, how did you sort of work out what we would need to take in from the athletes who are using our app in order to um, to kind of optimize this? Is it? I'm guessing this is to some degree. It's going to be very similar for most people. Yeah. So yeah. So because it's more it's, of an overarching yes. principle than an individualized thing. Yes. SRA is is individual to people, but that mm. is accounted for with auto regulation. Right. Right. We know that if we're you know it's also again it falls into the it falls into the category of human beings do certain things mm-hmm. like have you know eight hour work days right. Mm-hmm. Um, so if forty seven hours was the optimal time to train when you had perfect fatigue. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. You know, we would have a different looking program. Yeah, yeah. But really what we're looking at is the the principles of consolidation of stressors. And yeah. we know that it's going to start from distributed and move to consolidated mm-hmm. as we get closer to the competition. And okay. so we, we adjust those factors. Yeah. The the other factor that SRA plays into here with with the week structure is the number of overloading sessions versus technical sessions, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So you know, if you're somebody who's really, really strong, you'll have less overloaded sessions in a week, yeah. which automatically gives us that longer SRA curve to mm-hmm. practice more high frequency technical practice sessions. Yeah. Right. It almost gives you what you need. That's interesting. It does. Yeah. It's almost like we designed a, a program <laughs> to give you exactly what you need as an athlete. I might start telling people that I designed it <laughs> and I reached out to you to That's, see if you wanted to be the, the coach face behind it, but it's actually me. I, he did it and I looked at it and I explained, this is what my my dissection of the program that Seb just created is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you want to follow my AI program <laughs> that Max co-signed, no, it's definitely not like that. This is, uh, this is Max's genius certainly distilled into one... Uh, I don't want to call it a program. We we spoke about this before. Yeah. It's, it's not like it's competing with separate programs. It's its own methodology. It's like there was there was a Russian style or Soviet style of programming. There was Bulgarian. To some degree now there's a Chinese style of programming. This is almost like a new... It's a new style. Mm-hmm. It's AI programming. It's it's more... Um, it's 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 more responsive. It's more individualized, and it's for a group of people that now makes up the majority of the sport, which sort of previously didn't, I suppose, because there's yeah. such a large, growing number of people who train on their own. It's like a new methodology was needed because the ability to control variables like the Soviets could do with their athletes is not applicable to somebody like me, where I'm stressed one day, not the next day. You know, I can't be sort of controlled in that way. And similarly with the Bulgarian system, yeah, I can't, you know, for obvious reasons, I can't be doing something like that. So this almost, yeah, it's, it's another separate line of methodology, I think. Yeah, it's, um, it's principle-based programming. It's principle-based yeah. training. And so you end up with the optimal utilization of principles in a program mm-hmm. based on what information we can we can gather from you, whether it's... The initial intake of giving mm-hmm. us who you are, telling us about yourself, mm-hmm. uh, all the way to the day-to-day set-to-set, you know, evaluation yeah. of how your training is going. Right. You said it better than I could. <laughs> uh, I think, therefore, we have covered... That's such a weird way of saying it. Therefore, I think we've covered basically all of the different principles that we need to with regards to weightlifting programming and then how they uh, how they've basically been built into the weightlifting AI stuff obviously if you have any questions let us know down below if you do join weightlifting AI we're obviously going to have some kind of forum group where people can ask us questions Max and I will do you know videos for you guys specifically on either you know addressing individual questions or just general themes that we want to talk about so we'll put a link down below with all of the information that you might need to uh, learn whatever you want to know We'll catch you guys next time.